life and my life is like a lamp to a world that is searching for the path. We have become the example of Christ and we are now the light of the world. Can the world see the radiance of Christ in you? Evangelism does not happen by accident. Discipleship does not happen by accident. If we're going to fulfill our God-given mission as a church, we need to be intentional and reach out and share and introduce people to Jesus Christ. is an amazing continent with 50% of its population under the age of 18. If we impact the children, we would have impacted the future of the church and the future of our world. Each one of us has something to bring to the table. Are you willing to release your resources, surrendering your material goods or your gifts and talents or your time or your heart? What are you going to do? If we're going to plant the 300 churches, if we're going to reach out to a million people through evangelism, if we're going to disciple 100,000 in this nation, and if we are going to have an impact with the poor, with the needy, with children, with all the others who are part of our communities around us, it's not going to happen unless you have committed yourself to the purposes of God and you have been faithful to live by those purposes. talk about the revenge of forgiveness. Did you see it in that clip? I qualify to talk about forgiveness because I struggle with it every day. You just need to be married to know that forgiveness is not easy uh, because the more the intimacy you have with someone, the more they get to hurt you. I mean, I could be walking on the street and a stranger would step on me and I would say, God bless you, have a good day. Uh, it's a little different when your wife, who has known you for 20 years, intentionally steps on you. Uh, then now you get to, I'm married to a pastor, so the issues have not been as many. <laughs> uh, sometimes when we wrong each other, we just take a fast um, and lay hands on each other and bless each other. No, I'm kidding. We don't do that. We just have very blessed arguments sometimes. Not quarrels, that doesn't belong to pastors. We just have blessed arguments about certain things and they end well. Let me ask you a question. What happens when someone really ticks you off? Like really? Don't go spiritual on me, but what do you do when someone really annoys you? Maybe someone cutting uh, in traffic or someone calls your name or something. What, what do you do? Some of us withdraw, some of us yell, some of us yell from within because we are too Christian, we can't say the words. Uh, you just hear them yourself from within. Uh, I have a pastor friend of mine who told me, and I said, hey, I do that, but uh, I don't have the courage to say it loud. But he told me that one day his son answered him back in a certain way, and he thought, where have you come from? You were a baby the other day. He looked at him and said, I brought you into this world. I could take you out of this world <laughs> and bring you to God the Father. Anyway, uh, we go through offense all the time. I remember one time I was offended by, sometimes it's easier when you're offended by people you don't meet. Uh, some people decided after I had gone to church, uh, we were pregnant with the firstborn. Uh, so we were like four years married. And uh, we were staying in Comorock, and we decided to walk to church. 
because my wife was eight and a half months pregnant and she wanted to walk, so I decided to walk with her. And we locked the house and walked to that place and we preached our hearts out and people were blessed and I think God was very happy. And then we came back to an empty house. So when we were arriving, one of the neighbors said, I thought you moved two hours earlier. <laughs> we said, why? Because someone came with a truck here and packed everything and moved you away. So we walked into the house and the sitting room was like a hall. Uh, no chairs, nothing. I mean, those guys were not in a hurry because they stole salt. <laughs> Who does that? Sleepers, uh, cleaning rugs. I mean, they carried everything. I, I think they were just merciful to my wife because she was pregnant. The only thing they left were maternity dresses. Probably they didn't know where to sell them. And, and we sat in that hall that our house had become. And we said, God, seriously? We are preaching your word. <laughs> You should have taken care of our home. Now, what uh, took me time to forgive them was they carried away all our, our video, our video material for our wedding. So we don't have nothing right now. They even carried albums. Can you imagine? Those were special people. And so I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, we need to forgive these people. But in my heart, I'm saying, let's pray some dangerous prayers. You know those prayers, some Nigerians pray sometimes, uh, that their children will never know a father. You know, those kind of prayers. <laughs> but then later I just realized I needed to forgive and let it go. Forgiveness is not easy. It's easier proclaimed than lived out. And I think all of us struggle with it because offense is a fact of life. As long as you are loving someone and you want someone to love you, as long as you're alive, someone is going to offend you. If you don't want offense, go to heaven. <laughs> but right here, there's offense every day. Maybe a boss will cause you a name that you don't deserve. Or a child who looks you in the face and disrespects you. Or maybe a fellow road user who just doesn't behave well. Or a cop who insists they want a bribe and then puts you in a cell for a while before you get to pay. Or a spouse who keeps a secret away from you for a long time. The people are just killed. Yet if they can keep a secret away from you, you sleep in the same bed and you didn't know they had an account somewhere for 12 years. And you've been married for 12 and a half years. But you didn't know. And you discover and you wonder, how could you do, do that to me? We get to hurt each other. Or maybe our politicians who say some words and you say, seriously? And you just, we carry all of this anger. Maybe some of us don't watch news anymore because you might end up walking out of your own house. <laughs> and many times these offenses come with emotions. Raw emotions like anger and sadness and hate and resentment. And emotions are not wrong. They're just indicators. They're like uh, what you have on your dashboard. They're indicators of what is going on. I mean, Jesus got annoyed with the merchants in the temple and kicked them out. Paul said, be angry and do not sin. So offense brings with it some feelings. And some of us don't react very well. Some of us deny. Some of us get aggressive. Some of us press that down and it begins to show sideways, maybe with a drink or, or some uh, pornography or something else. But you pressed it down. It's coming out sideways in other ways. Or you become irritable that people walk on eggshells around you because you're about to explode. See, my friends, you don't decide what comes at you. But you can decide the beauty of life. You can decide what, what your response is going to be. You don't decide for your spouse. You don't decide for the other road user. But you can decide how you're going to take it. Whether you're going to bless them or call them any more names. It's your choice. Both the church and their child, they understand that eventually what wins the day or should win the day is forgiveness. We know that. That's not a secret. 
It's just how you do it. And sometimes when you know you've done it, and when you don't want to do it, what do you do? So that's our topic and discussion today. But I decided because this is such a large topic, to call it the revenge of forgiveness and narrow it down to five questions. Revenge of forgiveness is not original to me. Martin Luther King Jr. said once, the best revenge to your enemy is to forgive them. Then they don't have the right to control you after the fact because you've forgiven them. You've released it away uh, from you. But five questions I've heard from people on the counseling table and beyond around forgiveness. Number one, let me see whether this is your question. Does forgiveness mean I'm giving up justice? Does it mean I cannot insist on justice after I've forgiven someone? Is that even fair? I've heard others ask, number two, when I forgive, am I expected to forget? Who does that even? Is it possible to ever forget that someone wronged you? I mean, I still remember what my brother did when I was four years old. It was my elder brother and a troublesome guy at that point. And I had just peeled, and it was an art. I just peeled my boiled egg off the shell, and I was ready to eat it. And then he just ran and took it, put it in his mouth, and I screamed. And then he took it out and said, here. I'm going to see him tomorrow. <laughs> we'll talk about that. Can you forgive and forget? The next question is, does forgiveness mean condoning a wrong? What if this boss is always shouting at you? Are you going to keep forgiving him and he will do it again? Or does it mean when someone forgives a sign on a dotted line, I'll never do that again? The next one. Forgiveness and reconciliation, are they one and the same? I mean, there are people I don't want to have a relationship anymore with them. When I forgive them, does, I mean, does that mean we should still go to Java together? Um, what about, is forgiveness possible without an apology? I mean, my, my spouse never says sorry. He doesn't seem or she doesn't seem to understand that saying sorry is just a simple thing. They never say it, so should I ever forgive them? They don't even feel sorry. As I thought about those five questions, it took me to a scripture I love very much. That is in Luke chapter 15, verse 11 to 33. And I want to read it um, to 32. I want to read it and follow with me because we're going to pick up some points on forgiveness there and answer those five questions. Then we go for lunch. Luke chapter 15, verse 11, Jesus continued. There's a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. That's the first offense. You don't do that. Number one, you're the younger kid. And number two, you're talking to your dad. You're telling him you're about to go, dude. Uh, could you give me what belongs to me? That's not respectful. It's even a lot more disrespectful in this culture. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. Whenever I read that, I put in their far country, Malindi. <laughs> Because I lived there, and I thought it was just really wild. Uh, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he, he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out uh, to a citizen of that country um, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. Another offense is a Jewish boy or Jewish person, uh, for that matter, you never came near pigs. That was offensive. But this guy was at a level that he was willing to do that. In fact, the Bible says he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. That's even descending further. But no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, always happens, he said, how many of my father's hired men have good food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your servants or hired man. 
So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion, no revenge, not annoyance, not anger, with compassion. And he ran towards his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. This is love. Let me ask you, if you are the father, what would you have done? Should have called the mother and said, just bring that boy to his room and lock him there as I think about what we are about to do to him. Or you'd have called the elder brother and said, what do we do to this foolish boy? I mean, several things would have happened. I mean, only say those more godly ones. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Can you imagine the father running towards him? That's undignified in that culture. The kind of clothes they wore, if as a father you run, you expose your nakedness. That's not even good. But he was so full of compassion, he ran towards him, threw his arms around him instead of a slap, and he laughed on him. And the son said, Father, wait. Before you even show me that love, I'm not even worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, let's do this in a hurry. Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. A party? How do you go back to a party after all of those foolish things you've done? For this son of mine, he said, was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, someone had to be sober. The older son was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of his, uh, the servants and asked him, uh, what was going on? He asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. This guy didn't have emotional intelligence. <laughs> Can you imagine? He's saying, oh, your brother has come. That's why we are happy. That's not supposed to make you happy. It's supposed to annoy you. And he said, we have killed the fattened calf and we are having a party. A party is going down here. The elders brother became angry as expected, refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. When a father, a Jewish father, moved out of the party, the party stopped. And so he went out and he talked to the son and he answered, uh, but um, so his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you. Those are the kind of words you use when you're not happy. Slaving for you, never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat. They were like Kenyans. So I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours was squandered your property with prostitutes, I don't know how you found out that, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you, eh, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad. Because this brother of yours, give it back to him, this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost, but now he's found. Lord, help us as we hear these words. Let's come to a place of swallowing our pride and letting go as we forgive today. So looking at that scripture, that story today. Let me ask the same question that we answer them uh, before we go. Number one, is forgiveness giving up justice? I mean, it was unfair for this boy to ask his estate, go to Malindi, spend it all with some prostitutes according to his brother, and then come back and expect to be received and hosted in his own home. What was fair? What would have been fair was to lock him up and make him a servant. And make him pay for his foolish mistakes. There's no free lunch. Haven't you had? They should have done that. That's what was fair. I don't know how many of you have watched movies and you end up clapping. One day I was watching Equalizer in a movie theater. And Equalizer, this guy, Denzel Washington, sorts out all the bad dudes, um, as Trump would call them. All the bad dudes, he will go and equalize them. And I remember at some point he equalized some really bad guys and all of us clapped. And then I thought that wasn't a Christian clap. 
Because when people get even, we are happy. There's something in us that rejoices with getting even. That's justice. They are paid for their wrongs. But you see, my friends, forgiveness is greater than justice. It doesn't overlook justice. It doesn't cancel it. But it's greater than justice. It's when the father said, you don't deserve a hug. You don't deserve to be admitted back. But I choose to forgive you. And as an act of grace, I receive you back. You don't deserve this. I mean, I think about this, Father, and I think about God in heaven. I don't deserve to stand here and preach to you. I am not that holy. I don't deserve to be a preacher, but God, in his grace, he has embraced me. He doesn't deserve me, treat me as I deserve. He doesn't. Neither does he that to you. If he treated us the way we deserve, none of us will be seated here. Would you give him a clap and celebrate him because he's a good father? <laughs> Forgiveness is an act of grace that goes beyond justice. It's when you're treated not for the way you deserve, but better than that. You're a son who messed up and went away. Now you're received as a favorite son and there's a party and there's a ring to give you back your sonship, and there's a robe to cover your shame. That is what forgiveness is about. The elder son just felt, this is wrong. We don't do this. This is not playing even. This is unjust. But as I told you, forgiveness is an act of grace, which is greater than an act of justice. Is it fair to forgive a spouse who, uh, de- you know, uh, went on an affair and left you there and you stuck to your marriage vows and they come back and they want you to receive them back and treat you as if I never did that? Is it fair for a boss who unfairly dismissed you to tell you to drop the case and they buy you lunch? Is it fair when someone abused your daughter and you have to let them go and release them and adopt them like someone did once? I met a person who uh, a worker abused their daughter and then they received the man back uh, uh, and adopted them to be a child in the home. How fair is that? But you see, forgiveness is not about fairness. Sets you free not to treat people the way they deserve but to treat them in the way you choose by giving them an act of grace. Don't you thank God that life is like this? My wife has forgiven me many times. She's an amazing woman. One time she looked at me after I had done something stupid, and she said, Simon, there's nothing in this marriage you'll ever do that I will not forgive. And she meant it. And until today... There's nothing I've ever done that she has not forgiven. I I am glad that there's forgiveness, that you don't get treated the way you deserve, that you're given freedom to become a son when you don't deserve it. Number two, when I forgive, am I expected to forget? Impossible. I still remember what my brother did when I was four years old. You don't forget. But this is how you forget, is when you close the file and say, he ate my egg, but that's okay. I don't feel bad anymore. I can laugh about it. It's when the sting of the action no longer stirs up emotions inside of you. It's no longer there. F- um, file closed, no records. You all mean nothing. True forgiveness is not alone. It's not like I'm forgiving you, but remember You have to pay back. Can you imagine if this son, two years after this act, was eating his meal with his wife and his child, and then the father came and said, "Mm -hmm. Yanni, you think you could just enjoy yourself here? Don't you remember Malindi? Don't you remember what you did there? And you ate all your money? You're living on my money and your brother's money? Can you imagine how hard it will be that they keep reminding you what you did? That you can never enjoy yourself. That's not even fair. Forgiveness is saying I've let go. You owe me nothing but gratitude if you will. But you owe me nothing. You don't sign on a dotted line that you will never do this. No, it's freely given. Freely given. Guess what? True forgiveness sets you free from ever having to experience the pain of what happened. 
You're free to remember without offense, to remember without emo negative emotions. You're free. So am I supposed to forget? I may not forget in terms of memory, but I'll forget in terms of how it felt and the pain I still carry. I let it go. Number three, are you still with me? Thank you. When a preacher asks you that, just, just tell them yes, even when you're lying. Number three, <clears throat> does forgiveness mean condoning a wrong? This is a hard one. What if you have a spouse who is always hurting you? What do you do? Does forgiveness give them permission to continue to be abusive? What about if you have a toxic friend? I mean, they keep talking about you and uh, sengenyaing you on Twitter. All right, sorry for those who don't belong to Kenya. Uh, not Kenya. Sengenyaing means what? Gossiping. They just keep gossiping and talking bad about you. And you forgive them and still love on them. Aren't you enabling them? What about a wicked sibling who always asks you for money and they never pay? For these days when you're loaning them, you don't expect it back. Are you enabling them by forgiving them? Well, when the father of a prodigal forgiven, there's no guarantee that this boy will never go to Malindi again. No guarantee. He didn't sign on the dotted line that I'm going to behave well. Why? Because forgiveness is a goodwill gift. Can I say that again? Forgiveness is a goodwill gift. When my wife told me there's nothing you'll ever do here that I'll not forget, give you, she was taking chances. But she cannot be responsible for my behavior. I have my choices. But she is responsible for her feelings. So she said, whatever you choose, I will never have to carry you on my soul. I'll let you free. I'll forgive you. It's about you. That's what forgiveness is about. It's not condoning a wrong. For heaven's sake, you will not allow a person to always uh, step on your toes, to always call you names, to always do this and the other. Requiring standards is not about forgiveness. It's a different matter. So forgiveness does not condone a wrong like abuse and cheating and things like that. No, it just says, I want you to know that this forgiveness is unconditional. It's your choice what you do. I have forgiven you. Forgiveness sets you free to forgive the other person in spite of their attitude. In spite of their choices, you're a free man. Luke chapter 17, verse 1 to 3. Uh, you know, Jesus was talking and then uh, he said some things about forgiveness. He said, if your brother wrongs you seven times a day, forgive him as well. And if they come back and they need forgiveness, give it to them seven times a day. Now, for someone, Mildred, to sin against you seven, days, uh, seven times a day, they're special. <laughs> They're gifted, right? Uh, they're really gifted. But uh, he was just saying, forgive as many times and someone needs it. Let it go. Number four, are you still with me, good people? Thank you. Does forgiveness mean the relationship has to be brought back? I love it in the story we, we, we talked about. The son was received back. Father-son relationship healed. Sibling relationship assumedly healed as well. The family got back together. Reconciliation is a jewel of heaven. We celebrate it when people come back together. When a marriage doesn't have to break, they reconcile. When a relationship doesn't have to be sour, they come back together. When a nation has to move on and we forgive each other of post-election violence, it's a beautiful thing. But you see, reconciliation requires the other person to make a choice. So forgiveness is commanded in the Bible. Reconciliation is only advised. Because it depends on the other person. You can't force the other person to be in a relationship with you. But you can forgive them because that's your decision. So reconciliation is a priority but not a command. It's a blessed fruit of forgiveness. So yes, when it's desirable and when it's possible, reconcile. It's a great thing. I met a friend of mine that I give it to him. He's a Christian. See, forgiveness is always a pointer of heaven. And he sat down with me and he said, my wife cheated on me. And I caught them in the act. And I forgive her. 
that she cheated on me again, and I forgive her. And this is the third time. And I was just calling you here to come and witness me forgive her and just say I'll never hold this against her. And I still want this marriage. Fifteen years later, they're still married. And they're marriage counselors. And they help other people live well. Forgiveness is always a pointer to heaven. She had a choice. She could have walked away and feel, uh, 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 you know, the lawyer in me would have said, uh, you know, man, just walk away. Walk away from this woman. She doesn't seem to be serious. But the Christian in him said, this is my wife. Unless she walks away from me, I will not walk away from her. That's Christianity. Forgiveness sets you free to start again on a clean slate, to start afresh. Number five, is forgiveness possible without an apology? A resounding yes. Those guys who stole from me and took away my video for the wedding, I've never seen them, but I've forgiven them. They have never apologized, but it doesn't really matter. I have a right to forgive them and set them free so that I don't keep remembering them with bad feelings. Apology is encouraged, but if it's not there, you still go ahead and forgive. It's not about the other person, it's about you for your own freedom. As the offended party, forgive. You see, look at me everyone. Forgiveness is not a gift to the offender. No. When I forgive those, forgive those guys who stole from me, I wasn't doing them a favor. I was doing myself a favor that I could live without the power of those thieves, them controlling me because I'm angry. Forgiveness sets you free. Whether there's an apology or not, yet an apology is encouraged. I feel good when my son apologizes to me. I feel better when my boss apologizes to me. But I will not require it from them. I can still forgive. Apology. You see, it's good to apologize. Look at your neighbor as if you are telling them. It's good to apologize. Swallow your pride. As I like to say, it's non-fattening. So swallow it and then release the other person. It's not going to make you fight. Just swallow it and apologize and let's have a better country. If you, uh, without intention, cut in front of someone else, just say, I'm sorry, forgive me. Why? See, the one point of this someone that you must go to lunch with is this. Forgiveness sets you free. Look at your neighbor and say that in your mother time. Forgiveness sets you free. See, forgiveness brings peace. Your personal peace, peace with God, and peace with other people. That's a gift of life. Shalom is only possible because of forgiveness. Your peace with God, this young man had peace with his dad, peace with his family, and peace with the community. That's a desired fruit of forgiveness. Number two, it sets you free. You get free, the community gets free. Can you imagine because of uh, post-election violence if we were still fighting one another? As a community, we'll never be free. So it sets us free, individuals, families, and communities to live together joyfully. And lastly, the only possibility of love is forgiveness. You never enjoy marriage or a relationship without forgiveness. See, forgiveness opens a wide door of healing. A marriage that was hanging on a string could be redeemed because of forgiveness. Work so assignment that you are about to resign. You could forgive your boss and still work there and still be happy there. First mistakes, childhood hearts could be released because of forgiveness. See, whenever we refuse to forgive, look here, whenever we refuse to forgive, it's like God forgave you a $5 million debt. In other words, you could have worked all your life and another life and never would have paid it. And he forgave you. Then you go and find your spouse who has done something wrong and did not, uh, wasn't sensitive against you and you don't want to talk to them for two days. What are you doing? You owe me five shillings. Also given five million dollars. That's how we behave like spoiled children. 
And that's why the Bible tells us, forgive, because Jesus has forgiven you. Let go, set yourself free and forgive. Who do you need to forgive? That's a question as we wind up. You need to forgive self. Some of you are too hard on yourself. Whenever I talk to mothers, I say mothers are so hard on themselves and they get very, uh, you know, uh, critical of themselves. I mean, fathers in Nairobi, a uh, study we did, they spend 12 minutes with their children a day on average, Christian fathers. Mothers spend like one hour and they still feel bad about it. <laughs> well, you need to uh, organize to have more time with your children. But I think sometimes we are so hard on ourselves. Do you know why we are so hard on ourselves? Because we haven't received the forgiveness of heaven. The most just being in the universe, God himself, has forgiven you for the abortion you did or you paid for, for the family you left, uh, for another family, for another person. God has forgiven you whatever you did. Would you be kind enough to let it go and forgive yourself? If God has forgiven you, who are you not to forgive yourself? Let it go. Release yourself from that prison. You don't belong there because Jesus paid the price. Number two, forgive another person, your mom, your spouse, your friend, your ex. Your ex number two and your ex number three. They were just bad people. Forgive them. Let them go. Your boss, forgive them. Your spouse, forgive them. Whoever you need, forgive. Just release them. Let them go. I think I've told you this story before, but those who are not here, I have a friend of mine that I met in Mavuno some years ago. She was a virgin at 26. Then she got carjacked and gang raped. And it was before we knew what to do with HIV AIDS, so she got HIV AIDS. A virgin at 26, preserved herself only for her husband. Eventually, thankfully, the people were arrested. And she was called to come and identify them, and she did. And they went to jail for life. And she followed them up because she felt God was asking her to forgive them. And she went to prison where they were and visited them. And forgive them. Tell them, I'm the one you raped. I'm living with HIV AIDS. I may never get married because of what you did, but I forgive you. And she led them to Christ in that prison. The last I checked, she still visits regularly to go and see them and pray with them. That's Christianity. No one else can pull that off without the grace of the cross. Every time forgiveness happens in this world, it's a pointer to God who is the author of it. It's a show that he's greater than us. It's a pointer to the cross where everything was rolled away at the cross because he forgave us. Forgiveness sets us free, all of us. Is there something that you feel like you cannot forgive and you just feel another person hurt me so bad. I don't want to forgive them. Today is your day to walk out of prison and forgive them and let it go and delete the number and the messages. Maybe some of you need to forgive authorities like the police who have hurt you or the Supreme Court or the church or politicians or Im immigration department. Maybe you need to forgive others. I remember once, and this is not against Russians. I've met very good Russians before. But I once went to Russia with my American friends and at immigration I was selected we were on the same visa, on the same everything, I was elected, put aside, kept for many hours there. And they kept telling me, why are you coming here from Africa? You need to give us a bribe of a thousand dollars. And I was there and I was really annoyed and, and I think I carried a grudge against the country. When I was leaving the country, I felt God say, forgive Russia. And at the airport, I knelt down next to a, a bench somewhere, and I forgave that country. Sometimes it's a country you need to forgive, or some people harassed you, you need to let go, and you just need to forgive them. Or maybe it's God that you have a charge against him. Where were you when they stole my video for the wedding, and I was preaching your word? 
Where were you when my son was harassed and raped by another man out there? Where were you when I went through this? I prayed about this dude and I got married to him. He has harassed me for 12 years. God, seriously, I'm your daughter. You should have saved me from this. Because sometimes our church is against God and God never wrongs. So he never requires forgiveness. But many times we just have to grow up and say, I withdraw the charge against you. Because to have a charge against God is to tell the very one who forgives you every day, I don't care about you. And we just need to let go and receive the forgiveness that we have in Christ Jesus. So my dear friends... I may never fully understand what you've gone through. It may be something worse than anything I've ever experienced or would imagine. But would you be Christian enough this morning? Would you love yourself enough this morning to forgive the person who hurt you so that you may walk out of here free? Why would you carry those people many years after the fact? Why don't we have a party? A party of freedom like they had in this text. And he was telling the young man who wasn't forgiving, the elder son, instead of locking yourself outside of a party, come inside. Let's celebrate. We have a band in town. Let's celebrate. Many times we lock away ourselves out of a party, the party of freedom. Yes, there's a right to be angry. There's a right to offense. But there's a higher right, which is a right to freedom and a right to forgive. Why don't you exercise your higher right today and forgive? When you walked in, you got a piece of paper. Please pull it out. A sticky little knot. Would you pull it out? And if you don't have it, would you raise your hand? And as you pull out your paper, let me dream. What if everybody walked out of this hall today and everybody within the the voice of this message, the sound of my voice, what if you decided you're not a slave anymore to past hearts? That you're not a slave to what someone did to you. What if you decided you're walking out of here in the name of Christ who died for your sin, who took the bullet for you. You said, I'm going to live in freedom. This is going to be the attitude of my life. That you'll be able to say, like my wife said, nobody will ever do anything that I cannot forgive. What if you decided to let go of the pain and what you carry right now and release it so that you may go home free? against yourself, against another, against authorities and others, and against God. But if you decided, this is it. You walk out of here free. So would you write on that little piece of paper right now? Do you need to forgive yourself and receive the forgiveness God gives you? Write your name there and say today, I write this person, myself here, because I let her go. I let him go. The little girl who did something stupid in high school and got a baby, let her go. Write her name there and release her so that she may live without the condemnation of wrong. The man who left his family, write your name there and say, I release him. Self. What about another person, your spouse, your boss, a road user, uh, someone who uh, uh, maybe murdered your father or somebody? What if you wrote the initials of those people? You say, I forgive them, something that stands for them. What about an authority somewhere, the cops, uh, a court that was bribed against you or, or some other institution, a school? Write the initials there. If another is someone next to you, You could write different initials that they would never understand they're the ones. But write their initials. If it's God, you need to withdraw the charge against them. Just write God there. Write those people you need to release. What if we saw the beauty and greatness of the dignity of a Nelson Mandela who forgave the people who incarcerated him and worked with them to build a new South Africa? What if we began to be like the Kenyans of post-election violence? Like one I met who decided to work with the person who killed his wife and his son to bring unity back in the community. What if we became those Christians who are higher than the offense 
of our lives. Write those names down because we want to pray right now. Invite Pastor Kabibi here. But I just sense there's some of us who have been offended so badly. And God is standing next to you and say, release, forgive, let go. And then there are others who have never received the forgiveness of a father and never gotten born again. And I feel like God is inviting you right now. Say, receive your forgiveness. See, that's what salvation is, is to come for your portion. I have sinned against you. I'll never pay back. Even if I tried, you took the bullet for me. I receive my forgiveness. As you're continuing to write, may we bow our heads because I want to ask right now, those of us who have never received forgiveness from the Father, you've never been born again, you've never received this grace that is freely given, you keep working towards uh, amusing God and uh, uh, just making Him happy, you will never win the, that, uh, that race. Just surrender and receive forgiveness. Or maybe you were born again and then you moved away from the grace that is yours in Christ Jesus and you want to say, I come back to it. I come back to it. I want to receive the grace the first time. I want to come back to the grace that I left. Would you be bold enough to stand up wherever you are right now? I see the Father stretching out His arms towards you. And saying, Son, daughter, I have already forgiven you. Receive it. My arms are there to hug you. Would you receive my hug? If you need to give your life to Christ, would you stand up right now? as our heads are bowed. We want to pray for you. Or if you say, I was there, I left that grace, I come back in Jesus' name, I receive forgiveness. Would you stand up right now? God is saying, come. Come to me. You're my daughter. You're my son. I don't want you to live away. You're not condemned. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead and stand up. Thank you. I see you. You're just saying to the Lord, I receive what you gave on the cross. Anyone else? Stand up right now as Pastor Kabibi prays for you. Your loving Father is running towards you to give you a hug, to love on you. And he's saying, you belong to me. You're my son. Anyone else before we pray? Would you stand right now? Yes, yes please, please feel free to stand on your feet. <clears throat> Because the Lord Jesus Christ said that if you are ashamed on, of me before people and before men, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father who is in heaven. So it's an excellent opportunity for you to rise to your feet that we may pray for you. But even before I pray, I want to ask another category of people. There may be some people here who you've walked with the Lord, but something happened and you sort of fell away. And today you feel that the prodigal son represents you. You feel like a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter. And what we want to say is that the Lord is inviting you and telling you, come home, my son. Come home, my daughter. So if you want to rededicate your life this afternoon, please rise up to your feet so that we can pray together. Rise up to your feet if you want to rededicate your life to Jesus because you feel that, yes, the sermon was for me. I am a prodigal and I want to come back home. Rise to your feet that we may pray together. Rise to your feet. Rise to your feet. Rise to your feet. The Lord is here to receive you. Rise to your feet. That we may pray together. Let us pray. Lord, we want to thank you because it is you who draws us to yourself. Lord, we are grateful as we look around and see those who are standing on their feet because they are convicted about righteousness and judgment because they are convicted about their state and they are saying here we are Lord would you receive us today Lord we are grateful because it is you who says come to me all you who you are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest take my yoke upon you for my yoke is easy and my burden is right, right and you will find rest for your souls so Lord I'm thankful for those who have stood and Lord as we pray together with them we ask that Lord may you come into their lives may you lead them towards eternity yes they have come and they have said that they have walked in their own strength 
and they have walked independently of you. And today they ask for your forgiveness and they ask for restoration with you and with the Father. And so, Lord, today we are grateful because you have received them today. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for each one of these who have said, Lord, come into my life today and become my Lord and Savior. I surrender all to you that you may take full control of my life. We say thank you, Lord. Thank you for each one of us. We thank you in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And even as those who have stood, please, you're going to get a card in your hands. Please fill it. Please fill it because we need your details that you may be able to join a new believers class and join into a fellowship because we believe that we grow together when we are in community and when we have fellowship with one another and we want to know you, we want to invite you into fellowship where you can be able to grow in your salvation. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. If you've received a card or if you've gotten details, please do take your seats because we want to continue to pray. And now we want to pray for a second category of people. And we want to pray because you have listened to this sermon by Pastor Simon Bevy and you've said, that was my sermon. And you know what? Unforgiveness enslaves and imprisons us. It imprisons you, it imprisons me. And it reminds me of the story of Joseph who was sold, a favorite son sold by his brothers because they were jealous of him. And they threw him into a pit and sold him off as a slave. And he lived for many years as a slave. And then he was accused falsely of a crime he didn't commit. And he was thrown into jail for another long period of time. And it was much later when the Lord put him in his place of destiny and calling. When he found himself because of the gift God had placed in him being the most powerful, second most powerful person in Egypt. And it was at that moment when he saw his brothers walking into his court, maybe tattered, broken, beaten, hungry. And you must, cannot imagine what was going on in his mind. What should I do? Should I continue being a slave and being in prison by an unforgiveness? Or should I forgive them? And Joseph forgave his brothers. And today I want to ask, who are you holding? an issue with? Are you having somebody who has offended you so much that you cannot forgive? Is there anyone and you're saying that today this word is for me and what we are encouraging you to do is let them go. Release them. Forgive them. And today if you have somebody who has offended you, possibly it is it, it's a relative. It can be your father, your mother, your brother, your sister. Possibly it's a son or a daughter. Maybe it's a colleague, a neighbor. Maybe it's um, you're holding a grudge against a leader of an institution. And there's somebody you are so angry and so mad with. We want to encourage you as the church of Jesus Christ to rise to your feet and let them go. So if you're holding a grudge and you're holding unforgiveness in you, we want to say today is your opportunity to let go. We are asking you to take up the next step. Stand up on your feet that we may release him or her. Whoever it is, whether it's an institution, an individual, rise up on your feet and we will pray together that you may leave this place free. Free like Joseph. Free because you have let go. We are encouraging us to do that. Please rise to your feet if you want us to pray with you and that you may let go this individual. Rise to your feet. Rise Pastor to your Kabibi, feet. As a, as a rise up, you know, as we pray, I just feel like the Holy Spirit would speak to someone here who has been just sexually harassed at work uh, for a while right now. And that is really hard for you. As you come here, I want you to know God knows you very personally. And God has a good plan for you. Amen. Even someone who has been like physically attacked uh, you know, God is just saying to you, let go. I know you. I know where you've been. I know what you've been through. So uh, as Pastor Kabibi uh, prays, anyone who just feels there's unresolved something, 
Would you stand up? It's a way of saying, this is me. I insist on my right to freedom. Stand up as we pray together. Yes, please, please rise. Please rise. And thank you, Pastor Simon. That's a word from the Lord. And if you're in that state as well, do rise and we'll pray. Heavenly Father, here we are. Your people, called by your name. Lord, we know that it is very clear that you want us to forgive. Because unforgiveness enslaves us. You want us to let go so that we can come before you in prayer with a clear conscience. And what an excellent opportunity, Lord, because as we go into a period of prayer and fasting, Lord, we do not want to go into this space carrying someone who has offended us. Lord, we want to come completely free so that we can come to you and as we pray, you will hear our prayers and you will answer. And Lord, I'm thankful for this many people who have stood up today and said, I want to forgive this individual who wronged me, who hurt me, who really took me through a very difficult experience. But today, before the, 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 the altar of God, I surrender this person. Please in your heart mention this person by name and surrender them to the Lord. Surrender them and let go. Please let them go. Let them go and forgive them in your heart. Forgive them in your heart because that's what the Lord is asking of you. Because the Lord Jesus on the cross said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. He wants us to do the same. Just as we've been forgiven, that we too may forgive. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that as a people, we can forgive because you have forgiven us. That as a people, we can forgive so that we may be set free. And so, Lord, I'm grateful and I pray with all these who have stood that, Lord, as they let go, that, Lord, you will replace that with so much love, the love that comes from the cross, that each of these people will have, instead of that pain and bitterness, there will be a love for you and a love for others. And so, Lord, today we are grateful. And thank you, Lord, for what you have done through your word. We honor you and we thank you for forgiveness in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And God's people say, Amen. Amen. There's one more thing. There's one more thing. Before you go, you are given a sticky pad. And on that sticky pad, you wrote either a name or initials. And what we are asking of you to do after we have said the last benediction is that please walk up to the cross either to on the left or right of this pulpit and pin that sticky pad onto the cross. And what you are saying is that that matter, you have left it with the Lord, that he will take over and take over completely. Thank you. Let's rise to our feet for the words of the grace. And pastor, as you release us, uh, just wanted to say, if God has convicted you this week to go to someone and apologize or bring reconciliation, please do it. How beautiful it will be if across this city there will be reconciliations this week Amen. because of what we have heard. Amen. May the Lord give you the courage and the strength to do it Amen. as we go home. Amen. Amen. Maybe stretch out your hand to the person next to you as we say the words of the grace together. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Have a prayerful week and God bless you. Thank you.